Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, this is an interesting week because something happened that doesn't usually happen every week. There was actually a really interesting couple of papers that I'm going to review for you at the end, particularly one on uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. But first, as always, bird flu in the news. Cambodia has now announced its 15th case uh, in a six-year-old girl who actually developed fever, cough, and uh, what looks like a pretty severe pneumonia. Uh, she, uh, she lives in a small town in central, small village in central Cambodia where they have found 30 sick, dead <laughs> chickens uh, around the girl's house. And uh, interestingly enough, the mother brought these dead chickens in the house to, to cook food insecurity, so they're cooking her. But what's interesting is the virus that she has is a recombinant of an older strain and what current strain. So this is what we talked about, I think, a couple of weeks ago, that, that the bird flu isn't just a, it's static. It's, inter, it's interacting with other avian flus. Uh, and so there's a lot of mutations going on. So it's, a, it, it's, it's concerning every time it mutates. But there's a, a good case of a reassortment event happening in Cambodia. And it's actually a more severe form of the uh, H5N1 than the one that is circulating uh, in the United States. So anyway, little something to keep an eye on. And this is how global pandemics happen. Something happens in Cambodia or Southeast Asia, and the next thing you know, it's here. Also, uh, interesting paper on using the mRNA vaccines. I bring this up because HHS has decided that mRNA vaccine research should stop. Well, interesting paper. You know, there is no vaccine for HIV. This is using mRNA technology to try and in induce an immune response to the envelope protein in HIV, which changes all the time, which is why it's been so hard to develop uh, a durable vaccine for HIV. But at least some early results looked at the mRNA vaccines were very successful in getting at least some uh, immunity that would be, it's called neutralizing, so it prevents the virus from entering the cells. Whether that actually is a durable, you know, and successful strategy, we don't know. But it's a shame because, you know, there's a, they don't want to do mRNA vaccines. Uh, in the TEFI data, it's really interesting. Um, we haven't detected measles in most of the locations. Um, not a lot of West Nile yet. And also, most of the respiratory viruses are declining. But interestingly enough, uh, human adenovirus B, which is on the rise, that is a, a virus that typically produces a common cold-like symptoms, but can be more serious than that. And of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is slowly but surely trickling up. So with measles, it looks like it's stabilized at about it's 1,356 cases. This is the data for a uh, number of cases, uh, yearly cases. You can see we set a record. And the weekly measles cases are actually beginning to decline, and there hasn't been a big change in the state of Texas. So, so much for measles. The big concern, uh, of course, is this late summer surge that I've been expecting in SARS-CoV-2. You can see in the wastewater data, it's increasing all over the country, but particularly on the, in the west. This is the wastewater data showing if it's these dark blue is a significant very high or, or high uh, amounts of virus. And you can see in the West in particular, but Texas, Louisiana, the Southeast also, a lot of virus. And these are, you know, uh, uh, leading, leading edge kinds of indicators. You'd expect to see more cases. And what you can see is a test positivity nationally is going up for COVID. That's emergency room testing. And then you can see ED visits. There's a lagging indicator or, you know, that's when you actually get the disease. So we see the wastewater, uh, rise, then you begin to see increase in test positivity and emergency room visits. And we're seeing that. So I anticipate as we go through the early fall, we'll probably see another surge. Now, this, there was one interesting paper that is, um, it's, it's kind of obvious, but it is interesting because this is a study that looked at 174 children uh, under the age of 10, right as the pandemic was ending and as it got you know, we, we started uh, loosening up and having, reducing public health measures. And the, the question was, are, you know, did these kids uh, have evidence of typical respiratory viruses? So they looked at 16 different re respiratory viruses that would be normally in this, this age group. And what they found is at the beginning in 2022, when they looked at it, sort of in the middle of the pandemic, 
uh, they had no, none of the antigens. So they really were very much protected and hadn't, hadn't gotten exposure. And then as the year progressed, they suddenly you know, had exposure and so they developed antibodies. Nothing like that is surprising, except it does point out how effective the, the, the public health measures are. We, we, you know, there's a lot of discussion, do they really work? Well, not only did it work for COVID, but it really prevented kids from getting all these other diseases. So it was very, very effective at preventing respiratory diseases. The, the mistake we all made, I think, was we didn't open up. The, the, we didn't open up soon enough, the kids, and we probably didn't do it very uh, intelligently. The main thing was to try and prevent the disease from spreading so we could develop a vaccine, which we did because of uh, Project Warp Speed, which I don't understand why the president isn't taking credit for that, but he should. Now, another, I mean, just a bunch of interesting papers. This is a technologic tour de force. This is a, a group from Switzerland that was actually able to isolate the Spanish flu pandemic uh, from 1918 in a, in a formal and fixed specimen. So they actually isolated the virus from a person who died, a, an 18-year-old who died uh, in Zurich, uh, had their tissue preserved for over 100 years, pulled out the virus, sequenced the virus, and showed that it already had made some, had already, set, already had some of the main mutations that made it so pathogenic. It, not that surprising, but really amazing that they were able to isolate the virus from a, a specimen like that. Now, the most interesting paper, and this might have huge implications, is this study that came out of Rush on lithium def deficiency uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So when you think of metals and brain function, uh, metals like iron, copper, and zinc have really focused on, the to on toxicity, brain toxicity. But lithium is regulated in the brain, interestingly enough, and it's, it's the only... Uh, metal that's significantly reduced in the brain in individuals who have uh, cognitive uh, impairment. So uh, the, the interesting thing is lithium bioavailability bioav bioav is reduced in Alzheimer's patients because it binds to amyloid plaques. And the study looked at um, not only tissues from people but also in mice. And what they showed was that reducing cortical lithium by excluding it from the diet they were able to eliminate about 50% of the normal lithium in mice, and it led to deposition of amyloid beta sheets, the, the marker for Alzheimer's, and the accumulation of tau proteins, as well as activation of inflammatory cells, uh, loss of synapses, all the things that you would associate with Alzheimer's. Also, in these mice, when they had lithium deficiency, they did a whole transcript down, just looked at all the genes ex that are expressed in the brain, in multiple cell types, and it very much looked like the exact same kind of images that you get with the transcriptome in Alzheimer's disease. When they replaced therapy with a lithium salt, lithium orotate, it reduced the amyloid binding, prevented the changes, and memory loss in these disease mouse models. Now again, you know, we think about the, <laughs> there's more and more, uh, the HH is what wants to reduce mouse models and all that kind of stuff, you know, animal models. Well, this is a great example of how Finding something in a mouse model is actually really, really interesting. And if you look at, this is the mouse model on the left and human plaques. Human plaques on the right, you can see amyloid and pink. That's sort of the marker for Alzheimer's. You can see the same kind of plaques in, uh, in, in the mouse model. In, in lithium deficiency, you can see a lot more amyloid plaques and you can see a lot more of tau tangles. So really interesting study. So why is this important? Well. Alzheimer's represents the majority of patients with dementia, 60 to 70 percent, with over 55 million people globally. Uh, and for reasons n not very clear to anyone, lithium has been well known to stabilize mood, and lithium carbonate has been used for decades to treat uh, bipolar disorder. It's found naturally in the environment, in, uh, in minerals, and in, in, in rocks, in seawater and it enters the body through eating uh, several vegetables and also through the drinking water. And some observational studies in the past have sort of suggested that there might be neuroprotective um, effects of lithium, but it's never really, really been shown. Uh, the interesting thing about that paper is that there is no toxicity at all in mice that were treated for their entire life long. There's been very little evidence of toxicity. And so this should be something that we could really do a study on to see whether lithium supplementation prevents, uh, prevents the progression of, of uh, Alzheimer's disease. The problem, of course, is you can't patent lithium. It's a mineral. 
And so it's very, very uh, unclear whether any drug or pharmaceutical company would be interested in doing this. So this is another reason why National Institutes of Health is so important. This may not be commercially viable, but it might be a huge impact on, on dementia patients. So really interesting study. Could be actually transformational in the field. You don't see papers like that very often, so I thought it'd be interesting for you to learn about it. I want to end today with a couple of shout outs. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Dr. Christopher Smith, Associate Professor of Urology, who was appointed the U.S. Army Reserve Urologic Surgery Consultant to the Surgeon General. He starts August 1st to July 31st, uh, 2029, and in this role he will act as a key advisor and resource for the Army in all matters related to urologic surgery. So, very cool position. Congratulations, Dr. Smith. Uh, also, Harris Health's Ben Taub and LBJ Hospitals, our safety net hospital system here in the county, received national recognition for heart and stroke care from the American Heart Association. Uh, this reflects how great the patient care is for these particular areas uh, in our safety net hospitals. So a giant shout out to all of our Baylor physicians and medical teams based at Ben Taub who uh, play a huge role in helping this hospital provide outstanding care to the residents of Harris County. And finally, uh, uh, congratulations to Dr. Nicole Provenza, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery, who received a five-year, $3.7 million R01 award from the National, Institute's, um, National Institute of Mental Health for research focused on OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder. They're focused on understanding the role of deep brain st stimulation in treating OCD, uh, which is really, really cool. Brand new way of, of treatment. So, hope you had a, uh, have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.